Um, I think all, a lot of the staff here from the U.S. Chamber, um, they came, they flew in yesterday, and um, gosh, some people in like Katie told them, you have to go to Bucky's. So that's the first place they went was Bucky's, which is very Texas, and I love it, and they loved it. But did you have the beaver nuggets? Is that what you want? <laughs> that's great. I would have said go to Breakfast Club or something. Um, so thank you to Mr. Mosley. Thank you, sir. Um, during break, we just learned that Kenny Smith came down with the flu. He was to be here to speak with us today, but he doesn't want to get us sick. We respect that. So he sends his love from home, and then we'll move on from that. Um, we still have a lot going on this afternoon. We're going to hear from two brothers who are also business owners. They, live, they work together. They're brothers. They're going to talk about scaling and succeeding in a family-run business. Um, Hunter and Griff have brought a fire disc with them. Have you guys heard what this is? It's this portable pro propane tank, propane cooker, right? And um, they're going to give away one of them for free here. So they're going to raffle it off. You have to be here to win, so don't leave. Um, I want to welcome them right now, Hunter and Griff Jagger, co-founders of Fire Disc, to lead their discussion. Jeanette Mulvey, content director for Co, which is a new digital, digital destination for growing business owners just like you. And uh, that just launched last week. So come on up. We've got Hunter Griff Jagger and Jeanette Mulvey. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it. Hello, Thank hello. you. Jeanette. Well, hello, Houston. Or should I say Alaska? I was not prepared for this. <laughs> it's not normal. No. It's weather. So thank you guys so much for joining me. So I'm Jeanette Mulvey. I'm the editor of a brand new publication from the US Chamber called Co. Co launched last week, and um, Co's goal is to reach small businesses that want to be growing businesses, which is all of you, I'm sure. Um, so I hope you'll check it out. Um, you can see it on the iPad there, or you can see it from your mobile devices, but don't do that right now. So I'm excited to meet you guys finally. Um, I'm going to have you tell me a little bit about the fire disc and what it is. I know, I already found out in our pre-interview, the very most important thing, which is that you can cook bacon on it. So <laughs> I know that. Um, you were gonna do that, you were gonna tell me a little about? Yes, yes. So tell me, what is the fire disc? What made you think the world needed one? Okay, yeah, happy to do that. And I, I really love Justin's comment on the tuition thing. I think that really holds true in a, in a lot. Uh, I thought that was awesome. Um, first of all, the fire disc. I don't know if anybody knows much about farming here or has ever seen a plow disc on the back of a tractor, uh, but that's where the idea from the fire disc came from. It literally is a tractor plow disc. Um, and Griff and I were, we grew up hunting and fishing and, and started looking at it. And uh, we thought this thing cooks pretty awesome, but it wasn't portable and, and this and that. And so, Really, we started to look at niche markets, and, and we started to notice all this really neat stuff to cook on was in your backyard. Well, then we started to look at it a little further, and we were kind of like, well, why is anybody making anything portable and easy to use, kind of take places? But, you know, in studying a little bit further, we realized, you know, everybody eats and most people travel. So we designed the fire disc around that sort of theme and uh, decided to build a brand on that idea and, and that design. And... Uh, you know, that's a whole different process in itself and taking an idea and then actually uh, being able to mass produce it to the consumer products market is, is what we went after. So this was in about 2010? Correct. And now, in 2019, your fire disc is being sold in 700 stores in 44 states. Correct. So that's pretty remarkable. So, Griff, why don't you tell us a little bit about just what were those first years of like? I mean, you guys were still working at other jobs, right? Correct. So tell me a little bit about that. What, what were, so yeah. the idea was really in 2010, and for those first years, it, it was an idea. It was an idea that you, you knew where you wanted it to go, but you knew it was a lot of work to get there. And, uh, you know, and, and during that time, it was a complete learning process. I mean, we, we were in real estate. We didn't have a ton of knowledge in the retail manufacturing business, like basically zero. But we knew we had an idea, we knew people liked it. And during those years, it was really, how do we take this thing where we can actually bring it to market and actually manufacture it and create a brand around it? You know, you don't just wanna have one product, but how do we keep create a brand around it? So, I mean, we went from, you know, we used to get stuff off of Vistaprint and put it on packaging. We would reverse U-Haul boxes and sell it to Bucky's. I mean, because we, we didn't have the resources that you do, that we do now. 
in order to bring it to mass market. So, so, so it was. Tell me a little bit about that, though. So, so you show up somewhere and you say, "Here's we, you know, this garbage can lid or whatever you started mm -hmm. with. Here's our idea, right? So, how do you even find someone to make the prototype?" So, it basically, was uh, a napkin drawing is where it started from, and we went to a couple welding shops and said, "Hey, this is this is what I want to make. Can you do it?" And uh, here's the plow disc, and uh, it started from there. And there were different, definitely different uh, prototypes that we went through right. and different manufacturing shops that we found. So once you had a prototype and you took it to market, what did that, what did taking it to market look like? So how did you first, because obviously you weren't at Bucky's on day one, right? So mm -hmm. w what did you do first to take this first iteration of the product to market and see if people even liked it? We went to uh, one of the buyers at Bucky's and we put it on our website and really just looked for feedback. And uh, they liked it. They said, this is really cool. Uh, we need 30 of them. And we had none. <laughs> <laughs> so we found a manufacturing shop and said, I need these in 45 days. Right. And they did it in 90. Wow. And we convinced them. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we delivered to Bucky's. And uh, we got it done after a couple of apology tours. Yeah. It was extremely difficult to find these manufacturers. I mean, we're in a, a city that has a lot of uh, fabrication manufacturing, but obviously the oil business um, was taking a lot of that. They didn't really want to mess with these little grills. I mean, we had one guy, I literally thought he was going to have too many beers that day to actually weld our, our product together. And, uh, you know, yes. for any of you out there that are in the consumer product business or thinking about it, I mean, it is a total struggle from getting one to the other, but it's a pure example and it refines your product each step of the way. And you just have to realize that's all part of the process and your product only gets better each time you go to someone and but there is a struggle and you have to just embrace that i mean we had some stolen we had some oh. a container burn up i mean we, we did we had a container burn up so in 2016 i think you were able to quit your jobs right correct six, six years is a long time to be doing this and working your job so you quit in 2016 um, as zawadi said before you know scaling means something different to every company so clearly you've scaled um, what, so it, for you, what is, what does scaling mean? Does that mean being in more retail outlets? Is it just a, a number of units sold? What does that look like for you? Okay. Well, scaling for us was, first of all, I mean, we, we manufacture them overseas, but being able to mass produce this on a level with, uh, major retailers I and mean, we sell to Home Depot, Cabela's, Ace Hardware, True Value, and being able to actually service those retailers on the level that we expected. And, you know, when we got into this, we wanted to make sure we had, you know, better customer service than any of our really what you'd call competitors, but just a, a, a brand surrounding a business. So we could take one product, but we could actually have a product line built upon the fire disc original anchor product. And, you know, now we have seasonings and spicings, but being able to, to effectively scale that with retailers. I mean, that was a huge jump being able to do that because as Griff said a minute ago, I mean, we got some orders where we didn't even know how we were going to fill them. I mean, absolutely no idea how we were going to fill them. But, you know, that's kind of part of the process. And uh, sometimes you got to apologize, but sometimes you just have to be willing to, to embrace the, uh, the risk or the, you know, just be comfortable with the uncertainty of some of this uh, along the way. And uh, as an entrepreneur, that's just, you just have to realize it's part of the process. Yeah, so I want to ask you a question about that, or, or Griff. Um, because no one else in this audience is making fire discs, right? So, but, but there's a lot to be learned here. So in terms of really what were your biggest challenges? Was it hiring? Was it where do you really feel like you hit a wall? Was it capital? What, where were those moments that you said, you know, this really might not work? Well, there were, there were definitely lots of those moments where you're looking like, oh, do I still want to do this? Right. And going home to the wife and like, oh. <laughs> so, but uh, thank God I have a very supportive wife and family. Um, she's here, by the way. She's here and, <laughs> and my parents as well. But as far as the struggles initially, it was kind of in stage initially, it was definitely manufacturing. Manufacturing was hard because we just didn't know anything about it. And right. you learn along the way. And that's okay because nobody just goes, oh, that's perfect. Huh, that was easy. It never works like that. You learn along the way. It's like, oh, that product needs to be fixed. It was the first idea, but we can do this to improve. And so manufacturing was difficult. Once we figured that out, we, we did find a great sourcer in China when we knew we had to scale this thing. And uh, he's actually in Plano, but he sources everything for us in China, and it's been a total change. But once you get that down and you start growing and you have retailers calling you and you're selling online, you're like, okay, this, and it's been a topic of today is capital. That's a major part of it when you're selling a $400 um, 
product out there. So you've got to have the ability to have capital to scale it to take it to the next level. Because you know, with the terms that retailers require these days and the upfront cost of manufacturing your product overseas, uh, it gets expensive. And so, you have to front a lot of money, and that's where capital definitely comes into play. So what did that look like for you? I mean, did you just go to the bank and bring a fire disc and cook up some bacon and say, you know, what do you think? I well, mean, how did you? We've been through it twice, uh, but, you know, you just talk to everybody you can mm -hmm. initially and say, hey, you know, we've got a product, uh, you know, we're making money, we need to raise some capital. And we went to banks, extremely difficult to, to borrow money these days from banks. Um, and, you know, we went out to friends and family initially and did it, and uh, we're still in that process now, and it's been, it's been amazing. Great. It's been really good. Yeah, yeah, I know that's a big challenge, no matter what business mm -hmm. you're in. Um, I'm gonna ask you guys one more question, and then I'm gonna give the audience a chance. Um, a big part of your story is about giving back, and as you know, I decided not to start this conversation with, with that, because I think your business is so exciting and interesting without that component, but when you fold that component in, it really completes your story. So, you know, can you just give me an idea? I know you, you give back a number of ways, and, and one example is that you raise a lot of money for MS um, research. And um, just tell me a little bit about that, about why giving back is so important to you guys. Yeah, it's, a, it's very important. So we had a nonprofit organization, uh, Griff has multiple sclerosis that we built raised over a million dollars, gave every dollar back, and we just decided if we're ever going to get into business, that's just something that we do. So it's part of our culture now, is if you work for Firedis, we're gonna find a way to give back every year. And that's just what we do, and it's part of working here, and it's part of being with Firedisk. And this year, an example, we had uh, one of our employees' wives passed away from uh, cancer, unfortunately, pancreatic cancer. So we just came out of the line of spices and seasoning, six of them. Well, one of them is dedicated specifically to her and her recipe, uh, and we're going to give 100% of the profits back on that one to pancreatic cancer. And uh, I think it's really something a lot of businesses have the ability to do but don't do. So I think it's just important as a, uh, working in a community, uh, you know, in your city. It's just re I think it's an obligation that a lot of people need to have uh, going forward. Thank you. Did you want to say anything about that? Well, I mean, I totally agree. It's uh, it's really the foundation of why Firedose was created because we we worked, you know, we we created a great nonprofit. It's like how can we do this and you know run a business on it? And so I think I don't know that Firedose would have been here without yeah. the start with the Carnyman. Um, bike team for multiple yeah. sclerosis. This is a bike team they have to raise money for multiple mm -hmm. sclerosis. Okay, do we have any questions from the audience? It's hard to see. It was bright. <laughs> it was very bright. Oh, I think there's one here. Hi everyone, you guys done great. I want one, but hopefully I win. Um, so I have a question that a lot of times, a lot of small businesses and businesses don't talk about. What is a mistake or an obstacle that you faced that um, was a big obstacle or a big mistake that you made that kind of helped you in a way? I'll say one of the, the biggest obstacles we still face is judging how much inventory you need every year. And uh, we've talked to everybody you can possibly think of, like, is there a science this? And there is no science, and you're probably never gonna be right. And I think that's always an obstacle you face, and you just try to go by, you know, what's our budget? Let's stay in line with our budget and uh, reassess the next year. Um, so right now, that, that is our biggest struggle, is to yeah. obstacle. And I would say. top that off with, look, you know, when you have an idea, whatever it is, right, you know, people always try to paint you in this box, and even ma from manufacturing or, you know, talking to investors, you have this idea, and they're like, well, is it like something else? Well, when you're, you're doing something that isn't like somebody else, that's the reason you're going to be successful. It's because it's not like, I mean, we don't make a product, there is nothing like it, or if you have a business, and we talk to people all the time, it's like, you just have to realize, because they try to put you in this box, well, is it like this, or is it gonna happen like that? Well, it's really not gonna happen like, it's gonna happen in your vision, so you need to make sure that you're only successful because you aren't like everyone else, and that's your niche. So if I could pass that along, I think, um, because everyone else will tell you the other way. <laughs> Thank you, Levin Henry, Beatitudes. I know you mentioned, of course, it's, you know, it, a lot of your startup would have been through the manufacturing experience, uh, but what about patents? I, I, I think that many people, especially inventors, believe that that whole patenting process is a nightmare, 
And, you know, in addition to the concept that the process also is very costly and eats up a lot of your startup capital, could you, you know, share a little bit about that? Yeah, I would say get going first and worry about the patent stuff and, and things. You know, obviously you want to protect your intellectual property, but if you wait on that process, you'll never get started, uh, in my opinion. You can go back and protect. I mean, anybody can go take a product and copy it, but it's most important to protect sort of your brand and your vision, but you got to do both. Uh, and, the, and the reason behind that, it takes three to five years to even get a patent approved. So if you wait three to five years, you know, your idea gets stale. So I would say get up and go and file for it. Um, it's not extremely expensive to file for it, but once you get into the utility uh, patents, and uh, it, it does get pricey. It's a lot if of, you go overseas, it gets even more pricey. A lot of people have great ideas, but most people can't execute on them. So I think it's uh, you know more important to get going and then worry about that stuff later, because most times you don't have the money to do both. Yeah, I think we have time for just one more question. See someone here in the yeah. Erica Sanders, real quick, what's one thing or one piece of advice that you wish you would have known in, in 2010? And, and maybe that'll be two, since there are two different two of you, maybe there'll be two things that you wish you would have known or done differently. Uh, how hard it is to start a business. <laughs> 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 it was tough. Um, that's that. It's, I mean, it is tough to start a business, uh, for sure, but uh, one piece of advice I can give anyone is just do not quit, because good things are coming. You can't stop somebody with passion, and 100%, that has been our goal from day one, just keep going, keep going, because it is going to be tough, but you're going to get through it. I think, uh, you know, my dad always said, uh, get out of your comfort zone is very important. Um, <laughs> you know, someone up here said it early, it's usually double the time and double the money, and they're right, uh, and number, <laughs> number three, uh, I think would be don't listen to the naysayers. Uh, get out there and do it. I think that's a great place to end it. I want to thank you guys so much. Um, we have an article on Co about you guys, so please come to Co and check it out. It's um, uschamber.com, or actually, you can go to Grow with Co. That's the easier way to get there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.